That's a nice looking passenger train. But is that what's important? Let me explain. Now a little while ago I did a um, Bytes video on the composition of freight trains and a number of people have said to me can I do one on passenger trains so this is it. Now as usual I'm going to throw a caveat in right at the beginning and say that what you're about to hear are general rules and you should always research your area and your era for specifics about what you're modelling. So what constitutes a passenger train? Well for a passenger train to be legal uh, it needs five things. Firstly it needs a locomotive to be able to apply the brakes in the coach. So you're looking for a locomotive that is vacuum fitted. Uh, secondly, there must be somewhere for passengers to travel, naturally. Thirdly, you need somewhere for a guard to travel and control the train. Fourthly, it needs the right head code on the front of the engine. And finally, it needs a tail light on the back of the train. So technically uh, a legal passenger train can be one coach providing it's a brake coach. But clearly whilst that may be suitable for the smallest of branch lines that isn't going to be suitable for long distance or even medium distance travel for a range of passengers. So we need to talk about different types of coaches and different types of trains. Now this is the Wisney train on the Yarslow layout and I choose this because it's nice and small and we can look at the whole thing in one go. So let's take a look at the five criteria. It has an ex Lancashire and Yorkshire passenger tank on the front end that is capable of providing uh, vacuum brakes into the train and therefore that's a tick in the first box. It has accommodation for passengers in this particular case both for second class and for first class, but that's not important. It can be all second class. It wouldn't be all first class. It could be a mixture of the two. I'll talk about first and second class in a bit more detail in a moment. But anyway, it's got somewhere for the passengers to travel, so that's a tick. It has somewhere for the guard to travel. The second coach here is a brake coach. Guard has got somewhere to drive uh, to ride, so therefore that's a third tick in the box. Uh, what you can't see here is that there are correct headlamps on the front of the train, and there is a tail lamp on the back. So I've got five ticks. This is a valid passenger train, but there are a few things about it that are a little bit quirky. So let's talk about the formation and the positioning of the coaches within the formation. If you go back to the 1920s and 30s, the Midland Railway reckoned that two-fifths of its train accommodation covered first class and three-fifths covered second class. Now, the Midland Railway were a step in front of most other railways most of the time. They were the first to abandon third class and call everything second, upgrading their third class up to second. So they always laid on better trains they thought so maybe the two fifths three fifths combination might be a little high but for their mainline expresses two fifths of the seats were given over to first class travel now note that i said prestige long distance trains there if you're talking about a great western branch line in the south wales valleys you certainly wouldn't have two fifths of that train given over to first class travel. It was quite common for a lot of branch trains to run with no first class accommodation at all because the railway companies perceived that that's not what the demand wanted. Interestingly, when the DMUs came along, they did provide first class accommodation, but again, not very much first class accommodation. On local trains, it wasn't a popular thing. Similarly, catering in the form of either a full restaurant for the real long distance stuff or buffet for the medium distance trains, you wouldn't see one of those on a branch train. They were reserved 
very much for the longer distance stuff. So coming back to the Wisney train, this is two coaches, one of which is a brake coach, the other one is a composite, and you'll notice that although the brake coach by, by design is on the end, the brake portion of the coach is not on the end, it's in the middle. That's what's called an inside out brake, quite common in the old LNER and northeastern region. And you might think, well, that's a bit odd, but there actually was a very good reason for it. These small trains, two, three coaches, where only one brake coach was used, were used up and down the branch lines, and they tended to carry parcels traffic. You wouldn't get a parcels train on a branch line, but what you would get is parcels being transferred by the stopping passenger trains. And it was much, much easier to put that parcels accommodation in the center of the train than sticking it at one end. So an inside out break in, in this particular case where the guard and his goods compartment, his parcels compartment is in the middle of the train is quite common. Well, how many brake vans do you need? Well, there was a general rule that said two coaches maximum behind a brake coach. That meant that if you had a four coach train, unless the brake was in the middle, you would need a brake at either end. And in fact, common practice for trains four coaches and above tended to be a brake coach at each end. Some railways, and this is where your research comes in for your era and your area, some areas you'll find three coach trains tended to use two brake coaches. The famous Great Western B set, two brake coaches on a two coach train. In this particular case, it's a two coach train, there's only one brake coach on it. This is a four coach train and there are brakes at either end. This is the coastal service, five coaches, that also has a brake at each end. Now outside of brake coaches and catering coaches, I ought to say something about the type of coaches that were being used. In ordinary trains, you clearly needed second class and first class or second class and composite coaches to make up the required proportion of seats for your first class and your second class passengers. But the types of coach isn't necessarily confined to the class of passengers that they carried. Clearly there were coaches that had corridor connections between them and coaches that didn't. And there was a place for both types. If you had a short distance, let's say a suburban train where you wanted high density, you probably went for non-corridor or non-vestibule to use the correct term. You get as many seats as possible on the train so you'll find uh, the sort of trains that come in and out of Trinity Square carrying commuters high density non vestibule coaches now some of those trains did actually travel over reasonable distances and if that's the case you've got to give your passengers some element of comfort and therefore you might have non vestibule coaches but some of the coaches might have lavatories and you can see that in the coastal service this travels over maybe 40 miles. It's a non vestibule train, but in the first and third class composite coaches, you can see the white windows of the lavatory compartments. For medium and longer distance trains, you would have coaches that allow passengers to move about. So you have corridor connections between them. And that's very important if you've got a limited number of lavatory compartments on the train, or indeed if you have a buffet service you've got to allow your passengers to get to their cup of tea and their sandwich. So a very quick summary, you need to satisfy the five criteria to make a legal passenger train. You would tend to use compartment high density stock on your more suburban trains. You would have corridor coaches on your longer distance trains that would probably include some form of buffet accommodation, not always, but some. Uh, bear, always bear in mind, what the uh, purpose of the service is. You wouldn't have a lot of first class and fancy coaches on an excursion train that was all about uh, bums on seats and moving a lot of people from A to B. If you've got uh, express trains running between major cities and you're probably serving businessmen, 
they would probably have early morning late evening some kind of dining facility on the train just think about what your train has got to do all in all do your research read your books look at your photographs try to understand what coaches are on the train particularly lengths of train you don't need to be an expert if you're going to cut down lengths of trains as we all do try to cut down in proportion and you know, beyond everything else model what the railways would do not what you think looks pretty hope that helps hope that makes a lot of sense stay safe i'll see you soon Thank <laughs> you.